Greetings to all in the love and light of the one infinite creator. My name is Jonathan Tong and I am facilitator for the Seattle Law of One study group. We can found and be found in the list of study groups on the LNL research website shown on your screen. We can also be found on Facebook as the Seattle Law of One study group. We do meet on Zoom uh, twice a week, Tuesdays from 3.30 to 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and Saturdays 7.30 to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. You do not have to live in the Seattle area to join our Facebook group or to join our Zoom meetings. Anyone who is interested and available is welcome to join us. Uh, it would probably be the best way to get announcements for future Q&A sessions like this. Speaking of which, we do also have a YouTube channel where we keep recordings of past Q&A sessions with Jim and Austin and Gary and Trish uh, from the uh, LNL Research Channeling team. All are welcome to subscribe, to watch the videos, and to enjoy and learn from them. If you click on any one uh, video, you'll see that underneath there is a list of topics covered in that video, as well as timestamps, so that if you're interested, you can browse through the videos, find topics that are interested to you, and go straight to that part of the video for those who wish. Otherwise, uh, today we are lucky to be blessed again with uh, Jim McCarty, who is joining us for some informal conversation and questions and answers about the law of one. How are you doing today, Jim? Doing well, doing well. Okay. I heard there was uh, quite a windstorm in Kentucky the other day. Everybody okay? Well, as far as I know, uh, people are okay. There's a lot of big trees down, the roads are blocked, a lot of power outages, and it's uh, sort of sad to see the trees go. They're uh, beautiful beings. Indeed. Well, I uh, hope everything is okay. And our thoughts are with all in uh, Kentucky. I had a, a few questions that I wanted to ask uh, about the uh, Camelot Journal, and I did want to encourage folks who are on the Zoom call right now, if you have any questions that you would like to ask Jim, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat window, and I will keep an eye on it, and we will probably go in order. Otherwise, uh, Jim, I noticed uh, you've mentioned a few times in the Camelot Journal and I did want to mention at this point that uh, the Camelot Journal does not seem to be linked to the LNL Research website yet. I know it has to be moved over from the old uh, Bring Forth forum, but I do encourage anybody who's interested to uh, read it. If you just Google up Camelot Journal Jim McCarty, and that's Camelot, C-A-M-E-L-O-T, it'll come up as the first link there. And that's a great way to read uh, Jim's reflections on uh, currently uh, the works in progress of living the law of 1, 102, and 103. And Jim, I know you have mentioned uh, more than a few times that you have been in a, a book reading group, uh, reading a book called uh, Living Buddha, Living Christ by Thich Nhat Hanh. And I was wondering, do you have any reflections to share from it? Anything that you've read as far as Christianity, Buddhism, relating to the Law of One? Uh, and we also study uh, the raw contact teaching Law of One. Hmm. And uh, we just had a meeting the other day, about two days ago, and we we focused you know all all our attention on the raw contact. So we didn't get into the, the most recent. But uh, Thich Nhat Hanh has a lot of interesting things to say that very well correlate with uh, what Jesus had to say and also with the Law of One. So um, I enjoy this reading group. Uh, they're all uh, three of them. They're friends I've known for over 50 years. So uh, we've been through a lot of things together. And uh, this is what we're studying right now. And uh, it's very, very helpful to do that. It sounds like a great book. I have not read it yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as somebody who identifies loosely as a Buddhist, I've just found it fascinating looking at the similarities and differences between those two teachers. It seems like, would you think it would be fair to say uh, that uh, Jesus was very centered on uh, the teaching, spiritual teachings of love and unconditional love and Buddha perhaps more centered on wisdom teachings? I would say that's probably the most you know, balance yeah, of those two. the most salient difference, but then they also had a great deal in common. So, yeah, thank you for sharing that, and uh, looking forward to to hearing more about it. I did uh, notice just in yesterday's journal entry, 
you had a fascinating description about uh, your dream work and your journaling work. Uh, and somewhere later on towards the end of the entry, you talked a little bit about how uh, dream journaling was, uh, it brought up some memories for you of uh, negative experiences and how that helped you actually deal with those and, and, and balance those. And at some point, uh, you did talk a little bit about homosexuality. And if you don't mind, just wanted to read a little bit of passage and maybe get some uh, reflections from you on that. Okay. You said, uh, there are so many different ways of expressing sexual identity as evidenced by the current repression of LGBTQ people. This type of sexual repression is a definite sign that we all need to engage in communication and acceptance as to who we are, uh, who we and others are as unique human beings and remove the discrimination against those who are in the minority of sexual identities. I know this is a topic that comes up from time to time in various uh, law fund study groups. Uh, and I was just wondering if you uh, care to elaborate on what you said there. Well, here in Louisville, uh, there are three different bills before the state legislature that would prohibit uh, giving support to any people that belong to that group that are different. And that is so traumatic to the families and to the children as well, that uh, there are increased numbers of suicides because they see uh, that they're not being treated well, they're not going to be treated well, and our governor uh, is a very compassionate fellow and he is hoping that these bills do not pass. So I thought it was a good idea just to enter into a little bit of discussion there to let people know that uh, you know we're all different, we're all unique and uh, our sexual natures are very unique as well. And uh, we need to respect each other and, and let people be who they are and not try to make them conform to other guidelines which have really very little to do with who they are. Uh, I think that's true in every realm of our experience here in the third density, especially. Uh, I think that's the whole thing of everybody being here together and having all this turmoil on the planet, uh, you know, one side against another side, politically, socially, economically, militarily, that uh, factions form and uh, are, uh, you know, wanting to have their way and, uh, willing to go to some distance to get their way. So, you know, I've, opening our hearts, I think, and, and sharing what we really feel, that, that love of the infinite creator come through and see everybody as your other self, as Ra said. And we are each other's other self. There is no real distinction. Only here in the third density where we have the veil of forgetting, do we think there is a distinction? And that thinking there is a distinction gives us the opportunity to polarize our consciousness positively if we can see there is no distinction. We can love unconditionally at least 51% of the time. So that's the whole name of the game here. It, and it goes in every facet of our experience. And so I just wanted to, since I was talking about sexuality there at the end, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And definitely had questions about the, uh, that part too. I was wondering just uh, maybe as a follow-up, I, I, I do seem to remember Carla speaking about this at least a couple of times or journaling about it or writing about it. Uh, since if I remember correctly, she had at least one or two friends or people that she was in regular correspondence with who were homosexual as well. Mm -hmm. Would it be fair to say that Carlo was more or less shared your same feelings? Oh yeah. Yeah, she had a great heart. She uh, opened it to everybody. She saw people at the soul level, not just the way that they were expressing themselves in their personality shell, you know, in, in the way that they went about their daily activities. She saw more to them than, than just that, that they, she, she dove deeper and could see the soul that was, you know, the creator, that was her other self. Indeed. Well, I think part of the reason this might be confusing to people or might have caused some disagreement even within the law of one communities is there is that passage from the raw contact in session <laughs> 31 uh, questions 8 through 10 where there is a question asked about homosexuality and Ross seems to be suggesting that uh, homosexuality is caused by I think what they described as aura infringement from people living in crowded urban areas uh, and seems to be suggesting that, yeah, this is kind of a 
bad thing or a negative thing that happens as a result of that. Do you have a, a interpretation of those particular passages? Uh, my feeling about those passages is that we did not go into enough detail in getting more answers from Ra. You know, what did they mean by or infringement? And how does that affect a person in any way? Uh, we do have a couple of folks that are uh, part of the LNL family uh, that have written essays that attempt to uh, go deeper into the experience so that we can understand more what maybe Ra had been talking about. It's only a matter of conjecture, though, because we just did not get enough information on it. And that's probably the one area in the law of one and raw contact that I feel bad about that we should have done that, we should have gone further. But at the time, we didn't realize the importance of it. Well, I think the time is important also, the, the context. And I believe that passage was from like 1981. And people really didn't, mo that was not really part of the public discussion at that time. I think that was before any public figures had come out as, as gay. Right. Uh, I think that was just the very beginning of the AIDS epidemic, mm -hmm. which was a big deal at, at that time. And it probably was something that was happening mainly in urban areas. So maybe that had something to do with it. Who knows? I wish we'd gone further. I really do. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your uh, sharing. And I know there have been other sessions where I think Quo has also talked about homosexuality in terms of uh, part of each individual's need to balance male and female energies mm -hmm. and that each of us has been male and female at various right. times. Yeah. Our sexuality is a tool we use in the incarnation to learn certain lessons. Everything we do is a tool, you know, pre-incarnative choices. We have those hopes that we can travel a certain path because of those choices and the way that our subconscious mind biases those choices so that we see catalyst in a certain way that maybe another person with different choices wouldn't see it just the same. So it's all a path of learning to become one with the creator and with each other. Indeed. Uh, and that does kind of bring up the second part of what I wanted to talk about, uh, which is just the matter of sexuality in, in general. You did mention that there was, uh, during the process of dream journaling, it brought up a memory that you had uh, of finding a magazine picture of a woman who was topless from the waist up and your mom seemed to be not that happy about it and no. created what was kind of a negative uh, uh, memory for you at that time, which I'm pretty sure many of us can, can relate to for sure. Yeah. And you went on to share, uh, I believe, a passage from Kuo where they talked about the value of seeing everything, I guess, from the male and female perspective. For folks who haven't uh, read your entry, and again, I can only encourage people to, to, to read the Camelot Journal. Um, yeah, can you elaborate a little bit on, on uh, the uh, lessons and teachings from that part? Well, um, the whole thing that happened with my mom, my, my mom and dad ran a grocery store, a little grocery store, and they had a magazine rack. And at that time, this is People Magazine. Now, I don't know if it's still around or not, but I, I found this magazine and it was just a small one at that time. And uh, my mom noticed I was looking at it. And so she came over and gra grabbed a hold of it and said, well, you know, this, you shouldn't be looking at that. That's naughty, you know, that's sex. And I think that most of us raised the, that way. And I, I think sex has been probably one of the most difficult areas of investigation and experience that uh, people have in their lives because we don't really respect it. It's been used so much to uh, sell things and to punish people. Um, so it's, it's not easy to understand. And I think what Quo had to say was that it would be a good idea if we look at whatever sexuality or orientation we have, and then look at the other, look at other orientations and the way that they are expressed and see the value in them and imagine being them too. And that if people could do that to try to uh, have a, a conversation about well, what is it to be male? What is it to be female? What is it to be homosexual? What is it to be gay? What is it to be questioning? Uh, what is it to be lesbian? You know, uh, and you discover that it's just part of your surface personality. It's not the heart of your being, but it is important. It's the way you express yourself. You know, it's the, the avenue you take to express yourself from the very heart. So uh, that's basically what Quo was saying. And I, then I went on from that into uh, what you just read. Thank you. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that is something that we generally don't talk that much about in metaphysical circles, at least in this way, in a, in a positive, healthy way. And, you know, it reminds me, uh, do you think it would be fair to say that uh, Venus, I mean, uh, Ra's third density experience on Venus was very different from ours in the sense that they really didn't seem to have any of the sexual hangups that we seem to have on third density Earth. Yeah, uh, the sexual energy exchanges uh, and, and, and growing from a high sexual magic uh, and seeing the value in this, uh, they seem to have a very balanced point of view. Uh, it's probably why they had a you know six and a half million entities graduated into became the social member complex that we know of as raw. And the others that you know didn't make it, there were 32 million others on their planet that didn't make the harvest. Uh, I think they saw that uh, that Ra's uh, loving of each other and seeing each other as a creator was sickening. <laughs> uh, and that could be you know some of the problem we have on Earth today. You know, people have too much of a compassionate outlook for everybody. Well, you can't believe that about this person. No, he's an idiot. I know he's an idiot. You know that that, 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 that kind of thinking is just isn't. You know, doesn't make any sense. Uh, but you know that's the creator uh, thinking what it thinks. And if we take time to investigate more, communicate. You know, coming into union is communication, and really make an effort. Uh, then we're opening our hearts in unconditional love. That makes it more possible, and that's what we're here for. The whole idea is to open our hearts in unconditional love at least 51% of the time. You don't have to be perfect, just 51% of the time. It's just enough to point the needle in the right direction so you polarize positively. You know, So that's the big hope that uh, that can be done before the third density is over and, and our planet can become positively polarized. And right now, uh, Ross says it looks like the you know, the harvest will be small. And I'd have to agree at this particular time. Yeah, yeah. But of course, I mean, having conversations like this, and uh, I think each of us can help tip the needle in our own daily rounds, I would think. Uh, and yeah, I, I appreciate your, uh, your sharings on this. Uh, it does remind me, Linda has a question in the chat window that I think is related to another social issue that has proven to be quite divisive uh, in our current day culture. Linda, would you like to unmute your mic and ask your question? Sure. Hi, Jim. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Good to see you again, Linda. Good to see you. My question is on abortion. I don't believe Ross ever said anything about abortion, but I was wondering if Quo has ever had anything to say about it and perhaps the, uh, the spiritual implications. As far as I know, there's never been any question asked about abortion. So I wouldn't have anything to share about what you know, Quo has to say. It's just not something that ever came up, you, you know. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry. I don't have information. No you. problem. I was just wondering. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for your question. That's a great question. Thank you for, for asking. I think I have searched, and I think uh, thanks to the, the great search engine on the LNL Research website, for this topic or any other topic, if you go to uh, llresearch.com and you look for the little magnifying glass on the upper right. Dot .org. Oh, I'm sorry, dot .org, uh, yes, dot .org, thank you. Uh, if you go to the upper right-hand corner and look for the little magnifying lens there, there's a search engine where you can type in any word or topic and see what's been said, not just in the raw contact, but in the over 1600 channeling sessions that have happened with uh, Quo and other confederation entities. And I think I do remember at least one or two sessions where they did talk about abortion and about mm -hmm. the, the, the spirit or the life of the unborn fetus, but I don't remember it in detail enough to be able to say anything about it. But I would encourage people to, to look it up and check it out. Otherwise, uh, let's see, uh, I believe, uh, Hey, Sean, I think I saw a question about past lives in the chat window. Was that a question that you wanted to ask on Mike? Are you there, Ishan? Perhaps not. Uh, Aram, I see you had a question in the chat window. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? 
Yeah. Hi, Jim. Hi. Um, uh, I just am curious. I think you've alluded to it in past Q and A sessions about um, a personal experience with the entity known as Jesus, and I'm wondering if you could, if it's not too personal, if you could share um, maybe the details of that experience or experiences. Sure. Um, I always start my day with a meditation. And this particular day was uh, August 31st, uh, 2015. And we were just getting ready to have a homecoming. And for some reason, uh, in that meditation, I asked the creator to come within my heart and nothing happened. And then it came to me that, well, you know, the creator's already in my heart. So if I need help, maybe I should ask Jesus to come into my heart. And then all of a sudden my heart started beating really fast and the tears were rolling out of my eyes. And at that time I knew that Jesus was with me. And from that time onward, it was much easier for me to feel love and compassion for everybody around me. Because you know, Jesus said, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so that just seemed to become something that was more possible once I had that experience. It's a beautiful question, beautiful uh, response. Did you have any uh, follow-ups on that, Aram? No, thank you for that. Well, thank you for your question. I had a follow-up question. I know uh, in the um, Camelot Journal, the first thing that you always start every entry with is uh, your morning ritual. And I think you have shared a couple details from it before, but I can't say I remember. Can you share a little bit about, uh, I'm sorry, morning, Richard, morning offering. Can you share a little bit about what you do as your morning offering? And I'm assuming Jesus is part of that. Well, I usually uh, start off with uh, some singing and then a, a prayer or two uh, uh, to the creator or to the father. And then I begin my meditation, which usually at, at lasts for an hour, hour and a half. And at the end of that, uh, I begin, I read from the Bible. I've been reading in John right now and in um, Paul's letter to the uh, Corinthians. And uh, after that, I, uh, I read from uh, Joel Goldsmith. Uh, I've got a lot of books uh, from him. Uh, Don uh, was raised in the Christian science tradition, and uh, Joel Goldsmith uh, was a Christian scientist to begin with, and then he founded his own infinite way. And so I always read something from Joel Goldsmith, and, and then I read the, uh, the Law of One, and then uh, I pray again. I, I pray to the Father, and uh, then I say the Lord's Prayer, and that's it. That's a long offering. <laughs> How long does that usually go? Uh, altogether about two hours. Wow. That's beautiful. What a beautiful uh, spiritual discipline. May I ask uh, the songs that you sing? Are they hymns? Are they usually <laughs> well, the same songs? Or do you? Car Carl and I started doing the morning offering together when we were married in 1987. She had been doing that for for, since she was 12 years old, she'd been uh, singing songs and so forth. So when it was time for a song to be sung after our meditation together in the morning offering, she would sing a, a hymn from her hymnal. Well, after she passed away, I didn't know any songs from any hymnals. So I sing, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. And I sing that a couple of times. And then the, the song that we always sing after our uh, public channelings or any channeling is, I am the circle and you are healing me and so forth. So those are my songs because I don't know any hymns. That and, I can't, so beautiful. And, I, and I can't read music, so it wouldn't do any good to give me a hymn though. <laughs> you have a beautiful singing voice. That is really uh, delightful. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I seem to recall, uh, 
quo session where they actually suggested using row 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 your boat as a tuning song they could well have yeah but i, I also uh i also sing hallelujah um 10 or so times uh, as part of the morning offering which simply means praise the lord yeah wait you're not talking about the leonard cohen hallelujah are you no that's a beautiful one no, I, I, I was just like that's a long song too yeah. <laughs> mine, mine is simply hallelujah hallelujah so it goes up and then it down and i do that 10 times I could see how that would be a beautiful tuning song. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think there's something about the row, row, row your boat. You know, life is very right mystical. I think <laughs> there is very much something that touches yeah. the illusory nature of life. That, yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for, for sharing that. Um, I saw there was another question in the chat window, I believe, from Luke. Luke, did you have a question? Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Uh, is it me? Uh, Luke X. Oh, yeah. yeah hey, uh, uh, hi, Jim. Uh, this is my first time joining Zoom. I just want to say that uh, you know, I've uh, read a lot of book, uh, books on this, uh, you know, from uh, from you guys and a uh, lot of videos. I benefit a lot from, uh, from this material. I'm really grateful for it. Um, yeah, I do want to, I do want to ask a uh, one question. So, uh, I think Ra mentioned uh, his visit and the influence on uh, Egyptian people and the culture. Uh, I'm wondering if uh, Ra mentioned anything about that, the, maybe the influence on uh, Mesop Mesopotamian, uh, uh, Mesopotamian culture or uh, methodology, uh, uh, mythology. And uh, maybe a quick follow up is uh, uh, I think some say that um, they're like the Egyptian go god Ra and uh, the Mesopotamia god, uh, a, a god, a, pen, a, a patron god of, uh, of Babylon, uh, maybe they are the same entity. Um, I was just wondering if you have any thoughts to, to that. I don't know about them being the same entity, but uh, the reason that Ra wanted to contact the Egyptians was that they uh, felt that their way of being, which was pantheistic, they saw the creator and everything around them, was similar to a call for more information along that line. So 11,000 years ago, they determined that they would walk among the Egyptians and try to share some of the law of one with them. And they discovered after not very long that the Egyptians tended to worship them they saw them as the god of the sun, and worship was not what Ra was looking for. They were looking to help their brothers and sisters, who were also the creator, to move along the same path. So what they did have a chance to share with them, they also discovered, was reserved for the rich and the powerful, and that it wasn't shared with everyone, which uh, is uh, an abrogation of the law of one. Everyone's the same. So they decided that they would have to take their leave of the Egyptians and look for another way to balance the distortions in the law of one, which they felt responsible for. Uh, they kind of blamed themselves a number of times for being naive in their interrelations with the planet Earth. So when it came to the Egyptians, uh, they had given them information about the Tarot. And the Tarot is something they discovered when they were in the third density on planet Venus that had a way of giving you a description of the nature of your spiritual evolution in mind, in body, in spirit, that would help you to make the choice of being of service to others or of service to self. And they also discovered that the Egyptians took that information and they blended it with those from uh, Sumeria and Mesopotamia which had also received information from the heavens, you might say, or other entities, probably of the Confederation, that uh, was dealing more with astrology rather than the pure uh, forms uh, of the uh, major arcana of the Tarot. So they, uh, whenever we got into questioning them about the Tarot, they would mention, well, this maybe this particular image is astrological in origin, so you can release it from its stricture, which meant, you know, take it off of the card, 
because we want to give a pure tarot deck that deals only with uh, the, the, the path of in, uh, inspiration and, and evolution in the manner that they did on Venus. They weren't, they weren't looking for astrology. They don't think there's anything particularly wrong with astrology. It's just that it should not be mixed with a tarot because it, it causes a misperception in some cases. Did you have any other question that you wanted to ask about that? Oh, yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks for the answer, yeah. Thank you for your question. Yep. Yeah, great question indeed. Uh, Jim, may I ask if the tarot originated on Venus, does that mean the images of the figures that are shown in the Egyptian tarot as we know it were the same actual images they used on Venus, suggesting mm -hmm. that they actually look like that on Venus? Uh, the, the images are, I don't know if that's what Ra looked like on Venus, but that's what they constructed on Venus as the images they felt that were helpful. I think those were stylistic, you might say. Uh, and the, the Egyptian tarot as put out by the Church of Light, uh, Ra said was 95% accurate with what they had used on Venus. And what they did not uh, use only one image though for uh, each card. However, uh, the uh, Egyptians did condense all the images so there would just be uh, 21 of the, uh, the major arcana plus 20, the 20 seconds of choice. Right, I was just thinking that, I mean, there are figures in the uh, arcana who look pretty much like Earth humans do with two arms mm -hmm. and two legs and right. a head with eyes and nose and all such. And I was just wondering, is that, should we interpret that as meaning that that is somewhat similar to what Venusians look like? Um, that could, that's very likely what they look like because uh, all of the planets in this uh, galaxy uh, have third density beings that were evolved from what we call the ape and the ape body was that which was utilized to create uh, a form or a body for human beings to uh, exist in and to travel their spiritual journeys in. So, um, you know, uh, our Milky Way galaxy is, you know, 250 billion stars. So, yeah, Venus is very likely uh, also evolved from the ape too. That is fascinating, really, to consider that the bipedal ape-like form is yeah. that common around the, the universe. Well, no, that common are in this galaxy. This Don, asked, Don asked Ra how uh, many other, um, what percentage of entities throughout the universe would look like we do on Earth? And Ra said 10 to 15%. You know, so there's a great variation in what uh, third density entities look like. They can evolve. Well, you know, the, the entities from Sirius, the star, their, their third density became in 1973 and uh, abducted Charlie Hickson and, and uh, took him on board the craft and they evolved from trees. Right. And so, you know, uh, you, you can look like anything. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> you know, just depend, depends on what the Logos decides to uh, use as the, the form. It's the decision of the Logos of each of the major galaxies. From watching Star Trek, I was pretty sure that <laughs> they were all looked like people and spoke okay. English on every except for those Klingons. I'm not really sure about the Klingons. Except for <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh, sharing that. And apparently the Venusians were able to handle opposable thumbs without right. getting so bellicose about it <laughs> as we did on Earth. Yeah. I think their evolution was the ideal evolution. It's uh, it sure seems that way. Yeah. Hey, uh, I see Yuan has a uh, question in the chat window. Yuan, uh, Randolph, would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Hi, Jim. Well, I'm coming around. I mean, I'm currently working as a tree planter for a landscape company. And uh, I remember I used to have a flashback that I remember I was one of those like tree beings. Like, oh, really? Uh, the whole body was like, like all branches like uh, combined together and then there is a hollow in the center of my heart and, and filled with some like an energetic ball like 
like that. I remember it's just a flashback, but a long time ago. But what you said about the people, uh, the beings evolved in the series just remind me of that. And uh, my question is that uh, I tried lots of poison practice, and uh, in one of the book, they said by reaching to the point when your saliva in a month can gradually feels like um, turned something sweet. It's a capstone for the meditation. So I try to focus myself on the head position, and I found that the pendulum will rotate clockwise. And then I try to focus on my feet, and then I found that the pendulum will rotate counterclockwise. And by repeating this process, like focusing on head, on feet, on head, on feet, and um, I can accelerate this process that to, to generate, to secrete more sweet saliva. Um, would you please comment this phenomenon on the perspective of law for uh, I would like to, but that is such an amazing experience. I don't think I have anything to relate to it. <laughs> I mean, uh, the, the one thing I would relate is that uh, Ross said that we're all unique. We all have our own ways of interpreting the law of one and uh, discovering our own spiritual paths. And I think you've done a wonderful job of uh, finding a way that works for you. And I would congratulate you because the, I don't think I've heard of anything that uh, unique and uh, amazing. So, so sorry, I don't have more to share with you. <laughs> it's not special or unique. It's quite like um, a capstone you need to reach, but uh, it's quite for everyone can achieve that. I mean, they say it's something everyone can do it so yeah yeah thank you for uh asking that oh and i'm sorry jim i didn't mean to interrupt was there no, uh, i just want to say it's beautiful I, i'm so amazed that he's able to come up with that you know on his own spiritual journey that's that's a beautiful thing indeed it is uh and yes for folks who are watching this on YouTube, you should know that the chat window is filled with references to Guardians of the Galaxy <laughs> and I am Groot and talking raccoons <laughs> while we're talking about uh, tree-like uh, extraterrestrials. Uh, which reminds me, uh, Jim, I did have another question about something that came up. I don't remember where it is, but fairly recently, I, I think there was a, uh, session that I ran across from 1991, where the question, the questioner was saying something to the effect that um, uh, it has occurred to me that there have not been just one, but many exemplary lives lived on this planet, which offer to spiritual seekers a kind of template by which to live their lives in such a way as to approach an immediate realization of intelligence. And they were asking if there were other entities other than Jesus who had been able to serve in that way on our planet. And Quo said uh, that there were many wanderers who have come and, and done that, that we know about or don't know about. And then they said something really interesting about second density entities. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna read through this, see if you can follow it. I don't have it on the screen, but they said, there are many, there are also many entities who have come from this planet's second density through graduation into third and what you might call the normal progression of evolution, who have been able to so balance and crystallize their own energy centers that there has been contact with intelligent infinity and the resulting channeling forth of the intelligent energy of the one creator in a manner which is also that which offers a viewpoint, a template once again, or a blueprint, shall we say, or portions thereof for many entities upon this planet's surface. Th uh, that seems really uh, uh, fascinating to me. They, and am I understand, am I interpreting this correctly that I think they're suggesting that there are second entity beings and I'm not sure if we're talking about plants or animals or both who have gone through the normal process of evolution to become third density beings who have somehow managed to crystallize their energy points to be able to access intelligent infinity, intelligent energy. 
that early in their third density incarnations? Well, I'm not sure of how early they were talking about. I think what they were talking about was the contrast between wanderers who have come here from higher densities and who have achieved that type of uh, experience. Uh, like Jesus, for example, was a wanderer and uh, he was able to become one with the Father because he was that level of, shall we say, spiritual advancement through his lifetime of seeking. And he was able to do this. And I think what uh, Quo was talking about, about second density entities graduating into third density, and then eventually being able to do the same thing, was basically saying, you don't have to be from a higher density to do this. You can have evolved naturally from the first density, second, and then into third, and be able to do this as well. So it's not something that's just reserved for wanderers. Oh, okay. That makes more sense than what I was thinking, which I was getting the impression that it was possible for a second density entity like a plant to go straight to third density and not ever incarnate as an animal and early in third density to be able to achieve that level of uh, contact. Um, do you think what is it possible? Uh, 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 would it be fair to say that it is possible for a plant to jump straight to third density from second density without ever incarnating as an animal, as we know? Yeah, yeah. I think the trees, you know, in Sirius, did that. Oh. Right, right. Yeah, and this brings up something else that I think came up in our. Uh, study group not too long ago where somebody was asking about houses and cars and other what we would call inanimate objects having uh, consciousness. Mm -hmm. Do I remember correctly that it is possible for a house like the house that all of the uh, LNL channelings have happened in to have some form of third density consciousness? Yes, uh, Ross said there were three different types of uh, second density entities. Uh, there's uh, plants, animals, and places. And a place, like a house, this house, could be invested with enough love that it could become a third density being. Now, when we asked Ra about this house before we moved here, we were in Cumming, Georgia at the time, and Ra mentioned that it was already blessed by angelic presences, especially in its rear aspect, back of the house. So we know that uh, the people who lived here before, it was a couple, one of them was a gardener and one of them was an artist. So in some way, they were able to call upon angelic presences that were here before we got here. And so I think that since we've been here, uh, I've been here almost 39 years now, that there've been so many people here with open hearts, uh, spiritual seekers of truth uh, that really are uh, authentic and, and want to be of service. And so, so many good folks have come through here that have continued to add to those vibrations. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised if this house could become a third density entity. Now, I don't know how they would manifest, you know, in the, in the fourth density, uh, you know, if the, the spirit of the house would be that which would graduate and the, the shell of the house would remain. I, I have no idea. But Ross said a place could do that. So there you go. What a beautiful thought that that is, uh, and yeah, something to, to contemplate uh, for sure. Do you think it would be fair to say also that, you know, any other inanimate object, say a house that hasn't necessarily had those kinds of vibrations or a cell phone or a computer or a car has some form of consciousness just as rocks and water and air and fire have some sort of consciousness for density, I suppose. I would not be surprised a bit because you remember what Ra said, the creator exists in every iota of the creation. There is nothing but the creator. Everything you see is the creator. Every thought you think is the creator. Everywhere you go is the creator. The creator made it, made this universe out of itself so it could know itself better through all of us in whatever level of consciousness we have. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, indeed. That's something to meditate on for, for sure. Uh, I see that Don had a question about a dream he had in the chat window, looking for your interpretation, I believe. Don, would you like to unmute your mic and ask?
Don Atkins, are you there? Uh, it looks like perhaps not. Uh, I saw that David had a question about dragons. David, would you like to unmute your mic and ask your question about dragons? Well, the dragons was was secondly, but the first thing was about uh, bonsai trees because when I was a kid, there was an article in a Reader's Digest. Now I can't, I don't know if I was nine, ten, whatever, however I was, but when I opened it up and I saw the saw those bonsai trees, it affected me like nothing has ever affected me. And I kept that little magazine for years because I would open it up and look at those bonsai trees. And I think I was connected to the spirit of those trees somehow or another. But um, that's why I was going to ask if Jim's ever tried his skill at doing bonsai. And then secondly, uh, the dragons thing, I think there's too much memory, human memory of some gifted beings that were dragons and whatever. And I, and I think every mythology has some sort of a grain of truth. And that would be a second density bit being that possibly has uh, uh, tapped into the intelligent, intelligent infinity. So what's Jim's ideas on that? Well, I think I saw very possible. You know, I think any kind of second density creature can become a third density being. Uh, the whole idea of the first density is that there's a simple awareness. Earth, wind, fire, and water were the first beings that were created there. And uh, fire and wind taught earth and water to become shaped so that they could allow life to be formed on them. So then in the second density, that simple awareness is taken a little bit further so that it becomes more aware of the self. And as it becomes more aware of the self, then that self-awareness can make choices to give and receive love. You know, Ross and pets were the most uh, uh, common way of investing second density creatures to become third density. And back in the 80s, I think there was a book, uh, The Secret Life of Plants by Clive Baxter. And they did experiments there to dis and discovered that plants had consciousness, that they could respond to uh, stimulus, even when the, the person who owned the plant wasn't there. Uh, but now, as far as my own experience, uh, I've never done anything with bonsai. Uh, I have gardens. And it's always been my opinion that the best fertilizer that you could give your plants was love. You know, give them their other fertilizer too, but uh, be sure to give them love and talk to them. Uh, you know, there are nature spirits that are with every plant and every place that you can also call upon to help uh, the plants to grow and to do well. Uh, so whenever I go out in the morning, uh, since it's right after my first meditation is still dark, uh, I take a little moment to, to thank the nature spirits for being there and, and for being with me and helping my plants to grow and do well. So uh, that's my take on it. Any follow-ups on that, David? Uh, we obviously have followed the same course because I, I mean, I read The Secret Life of Plants and I think the last chapter of the book was about Fenhorn. And I, all I could think about was going to Fenhorn. And I would, you know, that was like clear, clear across the world for me, but I never made it, but I sure wanted to go there. Well, Carl and I were fortunate enough to be able to go to Fenhorn. And we had a friend there who uh, lived there then and still lives there now. And she uh, took us around and showed us their plants and their, their buildings and their gardens. And uh, it was just a beautiful place. Uh, we we're really honored to be there. Great question, uh, David. Thank you. Thanks for asking. And uh, say hi to your parrot friend in the background for us. <laughs> What's your parrot's name again, uh, David? Uh, Tracy, because it was a could go either way, and we didn't know <laughs> what the sex was until it laid an egg. And then it was obvious <laughs> what it was. <laughs> Quite this creature there for sure. Say hi to uh, Tracy for us. Thanks for being here. Uh, I saw uh, Dante, I believe, had a question wanted to ask, perhaps a follow-up question. Dante, would you like to unmute your mic? And yeah, I don't know why it has me as Dante. I'll have to figure it out, but I apologize for that. Um, sincerely, I apologize. Hi, Jim. Hi. Uh, anyway. So what is your name? <laughs> I, I go by Simba in this community. Okay. Yeah. 
or no, I, I'm sorry, you know me as Ukimoto. Anyway, so the question is, um, now we were you were talking about as second density entities and um, kind of how they have consciousness. I want to ask if that could also be a way to perform telekinesis by talking to them as conscious being. Uh, I'm sure that that would work. I've, I've never tried it. I just, uh, to talk to them in, I guess what was, what I really do, I use words, but I think it's the important thing is what the, uh, the feeling is behind the words and the feeling is love. And, you know, I, I do that with my, my cats too. I talk to them, but, uh, what I say isn't as important as how I say it. So if it's said with love, uh, telekinesis or words, or motions or whatever you want to use, I, I think would, would work just fine. Any follow-up on that, uh, Ukumoto? No, no, thank you, Jim. Always a pleasure to meet you. Thank you, I'm glad to meet you too. I see uh, Yi Yuan also might have a follow-up question. Would you like to unmute your mic and ask? Yeah, I want to share something about what Jim just said the best fertilizer is love it's like i have agricultural degree and uh, in my graduation project uh, i learned something about uh, they call electroculture which is using the electromagnetic waves to stimulate plant growth and mm. to reduce the chemical agrochemicals so what do you like they um, do some treatment whether it's on the seed before you before the pre-sowing oh you can directly like uh, give energy to the plants and doing their growth process i mean um the outcome is amazing like it's a tomato seed i treated and all the roots was like uh, almost doubled than the control group and uh, what i use is just a simple two batteries with the direct current as a static electromagnetic field and uh, i also know that some people they will try different frequency like different hertz different waves to dab it to the plant and uh, there's a lot more interesting phenomena in this section is and um, yeah. i highly recommend anyone who is interested in gardening to try uh, the electroculture it, you can just thank you for sharing that you want uh, feel free to post a link to it on our Facebook group if you'd like or in the chat window. Otherwise, uh, I am looking at my clock and seeing that we are drawing close to the end of our, our time for today. So I did want to encourage if there's anybody on the Zoom call who still has a question they would like to ask or if I somehow missed and you had a question, please go ahead and type it in the chat window and we'll make sure that you have a chance to, to do that. Uh, I see uh, Ishan, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Uh, yeah, I had a, hello Jim. Hey Ishan. So I had a question, uh, first of all, so I don't want to uh, take much of your time in that question. Uh, uh, I would want to like hear more on the healing, but uh, I, I had the question, follow-up question regarding the conversation we were having about the homosexuality. And in that aspect, I would like to know that uh, uh, if uh, any past lives had an influence, I remember reading Ra that uh, if any uh, particular person has uh, lived more of their life in both of their genders, then it may be possible that he may experience a certain influx of energy in that thing. So uh, I would like to uh, know if uh, uh, how much uh, past lives to uh, impact the uh, present life as such. How many past lives do you want? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Uh, how the past life impact the decisions in the present life? Oh, well, um, I think that most of that would, I'm not, this isn't from Ra, this is just my opinion. I think most of the past lives would have an effect on this life in the subconscious way and not necessarily in the conscious way because the whole idea of the veil of forgetting between the conscious and subconscious mind is to make this experience here in the third density as pure as possible, unaffected by any other kind of experiences because every incarnation has a certain person or purpose for the person to learn. And we usually have three or four different choices or incarnational choices that we want to try to follow through with. And 
we need to do that in a way that is pure and does not have coloration from previous lives. So I think that is the ideal. However, I think that some people uh, have memories, even though they do have that veil of forgetting, that do affect them. And other people maybe go through regressive hypnosis and discover past lives that ring of truth, you might say to them, and that maybe they begin to think that that is something that was important and that could have a bearing upon this life. So I don't think that it, the life pattern is always purely composed only of the previous incarnational choices or the incarnational choices for this life. But I think that's the goal. Okay. So my main question is regarding the healing. As the Ra describes the healing to be an acceptance of what is, everything is in harmony and uh, everything is unity. So regarding that uh, thing, uh, I had seen various other practices of healing which involved, you know, positive imbuement of energy and removal of negative energy like Reiki. And there are certain manifestation techniques in which uh, you impress the ideal situation of healing which you want to be imposed on your current reality. And, uh, but the Ra says like you, everything is unity and uh, everything is as in harmony as it is now. So can you elaborate more on the healing aspect that Ra describes because I'm currently uh, suffering with fever <laughs> and that catalyst that strikes me. Yeah, well, the yeah. basic quality of healing, uh, you can go to healers and basically what healers do is to interrupt what Ra called the uh, red and violet shell that is combined with the red energy center and the violet that holds whatever condition of health or disease you have in place. So that what a healer does is to interrupt that, to give you the chance to do the healing if it is in conjunction with your higher self's agreement, you might say. So I think the healing also, Ra mentioned, could be done by yourself if you in meditation can go deep enough into yourself to see that at the heart of your being, all is well, that you are balanced, and that there is no distortion, that there, uh, whatever condition you experience is something right now that expresses a certain level of your growth, but you can heal yourself of whatever might be a problem for you now, any kind of disease or mental configuration of thought by basically faith and will, and discovering that there is that perfection resting deep within you that represents healing, and that you can follow that path too. Okay, thank you. So I have a follow-up question from this. Uh, like uh, healing, I also uh, remember like the mentioning of uh, catalyst which causes diseases, like if any catalyst is left unprocessed, it may turn into a disease. And uh, I would like to have a corresponding question from this, like how the catalyst of mind, body, and spirit as an archetype can be processed. Yes, the uh, whole idea of the catalyst causing a disease is that if we don't mentally use catalyst that comes our way, then it is given to the body complex and it's reflected there in a symbolic fashion. And I think that one of the best examples would be my own uh, during the raw contact. Um, I had a disagreement with Don. Uh, he wanted to publish all of the books we had at that time uh, into one book. And I told him we didn't have the money to do that. I was keeping our books at that time, but he persisted. He wanted to do that. And so I, I said, no, we, we don't have the money, Don. We can't do it. And at that moment, uh, somebody knocked at our door. And in our living room, it was a long living room. There was a couch that separated uh, the part of the living room that we use for our meditation from the rest of the living room. So I expressed my anger by hurtling that couch and then answering the door. And I didn't resolve the difficulty th that day with Don. So that night, uh, we had uh, negative entities that were attempting to stop the raw contact. So one of them led a you know, common wood spider to bite me on the elbow. And so within two weeks, I developed um, uh, nephrotic syndrome or minimal chain syndrome. My kidneys, which is the orange ray energy center, one-to-one -one relationship, uh, began to malfunction and I gained 20 pounds of water weight within two weeks. So I had to go through a whole process of uh, using Lasix and so forth to get rid of 
that type of a water gain and weight gain. But if I had simply used that catalyst and talked it out with God instead of getting angry with him, then that wouldn't have happened. Uh, that negative entity uh, intensified the spider bite to the equivalent of a water moccasin, which as you know, is a, a poisonous snake. So that type of uh, action on my part was uh, what brought about the disease. I didn't use the catalyst by talking it out with God. I kept it to myself and I got angry and I paid the price. <laughs> Thank you so much for the insight, Dan. Thank you for the question. <laughs> That's a great question. And, you know, I have heard you share that story more than a few times here, Jim, and it's different. Every time you share it, I see it and hear it in a little bit different way, or you'll share a little bit more of it that I didn't hear before. So it's really a beautiful spiraling learning that, that we get from, from these stories. So really, thank you for uh, sharing those teachings. And if you don't mind, I have one more question before we wrap things up, because speaking of, of Don, you mentioned in our last Q&A that you uh, uh, believe that Don has reincarnated uh, in the form of a person named Kenneth, who, as I recall, you said was the son of the best man at your wedding and, uh, and Carla's matron of honor. I don't remember. I know you described uh, the person as uh, having a big heart and maybe exemplifying the 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 love that uh, Don had. Uh, the path he'd chosen not to follow in his last incarnation and might have been choosing to do in this incarnation. And I was wondering, is there anything else you can share about how you have come to know or believe that this person is, in fact, uh, Don reincarnated? Well, we can't know that, you know, for sure. But what we know is that uh, about a year after Don passed away, that uh, Ron and Sonia, who Ron was my best man, Sonia was Carl's matron of honor, uh, made love. And then Sonia told Ron right after that, Ron, I'm pregnant and it's Don. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to say, but that, you know, Kenneth grew up, uh, Don was six feet five, uh, Kenneth was the same size. Uh, Don, when he was 26 years old, decided this was a crazy world. It was not a good place to be. The best you could hope for is a private room, you know, an insane asylum. <laughs> and uh, so he decided he wasn't going to let his feelings, both positive and negative, take him on rides like everybody else did. You know, they, they want to get real happy and real sad and all that. So he was going to be an observer, a simple observer, which meant he was cutting himself off from his heart. And Kenneth, of course, does have a big heart. Uh, so that's all I can say. I don't know if that's Don or not, but he's a good guy. I really like him. We, he lived here for a little while back in about 2003. Wow. What a beautiful story. Yeah, uh, thank you for, for sharing that. I appreciate it. Uh, so you never did anything like they do to, with the Dalai Lama when they're testing <laughs> you know, somebody to be reincarnation of the Dalai Lama? Like, did you, you didn't give him any of Don's personal possessions when he was a child to see if he had any kind of attachment to them or any? No. Uh, when he was five years old, uh, I took him for a drive up to uh, northern Kentucky where we had uh, some property. It was an old abandoned farm. And uh, on the way there, he, uh, he said, do you know why planes fly? Because the air pressure is greater under the wing than on top of the wing. And I thought, <laughs> five-year-old kid knows this. <laughs> yeah. yeah, speaking of a former and, uh, airline pilot. Huh? Right, yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Do you have any idea whether Carla has reincarnated at all? <laughs> any inclinations? I rather doubt it because I, I call upon her every time I meditate and uh, every time I channel to help me do my best channeling. And I've had contacts with her in dreams uh, after she passed away. Um, so I don't 
think she needed to reincarnate, uh, but I think she needed to stay around to help out. That's nice. Yeah. Oh, such such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Thank you for uh, sharing. Thank you for answering my weird questions. I see uh, Ukumara has uh, perhaps a follow up question. Would you like to ask Ukumara? Yes, brother. Perhaps one last question, um, brother Jim. Do you think? I mean, it, it doesn't appear there's any outstanding interest to have this entity, uh, our brother Kenneth, do a past life regression himself. But I'm curious: is has anyone ever been interested? to maybe, you know, kind of test it out at any given point in time or, or no? There hasn't been any interest in it because he really doesn't believe in it. He uh, thinks, well, that's really a, you know, interesting thought, but, you know, I'm not anybody else but me, you know, I've never. So it would be kind of an infringement on his free will to ask him to go through that. Of course. Thank you, John. Love well, you. Thank you for your question. Love you too. Fair question. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and I did want to note that uh, our next Q&A session on April 1st, if I remember correctly, will mark the anniversary of Carlo's passing into a larger life. Is that correct? Yes, yes sir. It'll be the eighth anniversary. Yes, it would be lovely to uh, dedicate that session to uh, Carlo's memory and share some more uh, wonderful stories about that special person. So want to encourage folks to uh, join us again about a month from now. Until then, we are about out of time for today. I uh, want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, Jim, did you have any uh, closing thoughts or reflections you'd like to share before we wrap things up for today? Well, I always enjoy the questions uh, because they help me learn more about myself and the, the law of one. It's like uh, each question is a facet of a jewel almost. And together we're making this crystal with all the questions and my hope for answers, which uh, I do my best, but they're in my opinion, as you know. So I thank you for helping me and us all work together to create this crystal that is our shared consciousness and our social memory complex. I look forward every month to uh, renew our gatherings and our, our questions, our answers, and our just sharing the love of the heart that comes through each one of us. Indeed. Well, thank you so much. It is uh, such a joy and an honor and a privilege always to be here with you. I always appreciate the honesty and love and compassion that comes with your answers, whether you have an answer or not. <laughs> As you said, the questions are, are, are great and I always enjoy them too. So thank you uh, for uh, all you have done and continue to do in service to others. Uh, thank you to all our friends at l and Research for all they have done and continue to do in service to others. Thank you for all uh, who joined us on the Zoom call. That's a great turnout and really enjoyed uh, being together and learning and, and growing together. Blessings to you all and to all who are watching this on YouTube at some later uh, place in time. Thank you for, for being here and for all you do as well. Until next time, in the love and light of the one infinite creator. Adonai. Namaste. Love you all. Thank you.